So I would like to uh, share with you a slide program on my trips down to the Amazon River ecosystem. And uh, you can download this presentation, just the slides only, but I thought I'd give you a little bit of the talk that I will do when I do this uh, presentation live. So let's uh, take a look here. Here we have uh, the Amazon River Adventures. I'll tell you, the Amazon is a fantastic river. It supports more life and more different biomes and, and, and uh, living and non-living uh, aspects of an ecosystem. It's just amazing. And until you actually have seen it, it's hard to believe how beautiful it is. So the Amazon River is actually a large system of many, many rivers and a drainage basin that's in South America in the country of Brazil. In fact, four or five of the rivers that make up the Amazon basin are actually larger than the Mississippi. It's uh, right on the equator, so it's uh, a constant 85 to 90 degrees almost every day. It gets lots of rainfall, and it is probably one of the most biodiverse places in the world. Biodiverse means that there are many, many different species of plants and animals. So I'm going to focus on the river, the life on the river. And so there are three types of rivers in the, in the Amazon. And here is the Rio Negro. And this is uh, our boat that we stayed on for a week and lived on. And, and everything you see there is actually a product of that ecosystem. The trees, the lumber, the food we ate, and even the water and the sand on the beaches, both living and non-living. This boat was called the Casiquiari, and it was our home. The Rio Negro, the water is dark, dark from all the tannins or all the chemicals that come off the leaves. You see, this is a tropical rainforest, so there are trees that have leaves on them and are green all year round. Not like some of the trees here in North America that are deciduous, when it gets cold, the adaptation is for the leaves to fall to the ground. In the rainforest, the leaves are falling all the time and new ones are growing all the time. The chemicals in those leaves in certain parts of the Amazon stain the water brown, hence the name Rio Negro or the Black River. In fact, the water is so beautiful here, it's very acidic, so this is an abiotic part of the ecosystem. There's hardly any dissolved solids in the water, and so the animals that live there are used to these types of water conditions. Butterflies and uh, uh, a lot of insects, insects that you would not believe. Uh, uh, one of our friends uh, was doing a study on butterflies and collecting them, and you notice there's leaf litter decomposing on the bank and in the water adding to the brown color. A mineral, which is an abiotic part of an ecosystem that's, that's not very prevalent in the Amazon, is salt. So it was pretty easy to see butterflies up close, because when we would sweat, they would be attracted to us or to where the water had dried up to lick up salts and minerals. And here you see, oh, about 100 butterflies that are stopped, and they are actually taking minerals off the evaporated water. Not very mineral, many minerals in the soil itself. Now two of the rivers come together, and this is called the wetting of the waters, where the Rio Negro and the Rio Solomois come together to form the Amazon River. And these two waters chemically are so different that the animals from one part, the dark water, and from the brown water actually are stunned from the chemicals when they go back and forth. This is a favorite place for dolphin, river dolphin, to come and to catch easy fish as they have a hard time adjusting to two different biomes, the dark water and the more sediment-filled water. The best way to go in this ecosystem is by boat. And so often, when the boat on the right is called the iguana, we would stay on that boat, and we often uh, would take along scientists and help pay for them to do more studies of the fishes of the Amazon. Here's uh, uh, some of the scientists uh, with me. Uh, the guy with the blue shirt behind me is, is Scott Dowd. He is uh, a leading ichthyologist, and he is also the freshwater aquarius for the New England Aquarium. And so we would make these trips, and you notice no roads, <laughs> no paths, just water. 
Sometimes the water, uh, here's the part of this ecosystem, the water would come up and go down. I remember we went up this one uh, stream, or Igarapo, and when it was time to come back, uh, we had a hard time cutting through the, some of the sunken uh, trees that, were, that we could easily canoe across on the way upriver. Fishes and fishing in the Amazon. Uh, the people there depend on the river for all of its food. And there are, all, there are more different types of species of fish in the Amazon than in the ocean. And many of them are yet to be discovered. People fish with rod and reel. And in the Amazon, if you get your hook stuck in a log, you just walk out and get it. Well, at least our, my friend here would. And this is a fish uh, that I caught. It's called a black piranha. Its head is bony. And its teeth are incredibly sharp. I can show you one after the presentation. This fish is perfectly suited for the Amazon. Everything has a place, and every place has species that fill the different niches in the different parts of the, of the Amazon. Beautiful fish. Dangerous fish. Why is it dangerous? Because it has razor-sharp teeth. And its job is, besides eating other fish, there's 20 different species of piranha, some of them just eat the scales off of other fish. This black piranha, though, was pretty bad. It, it had some sharp teeth. Carnivore? I think so. Another way we would collect fish is by netting them with a seine to see all the different biodiversity and the catfishes, the cichlids, uh, the loaches. There's all it was amazing, amazing fish. The people in, uh, along the river called the Caboclos, they fish with a cast net. And this is what they do for their food. They look for, and this, look at this habitat, a flooded forest of, uh, and also the swampy area. And these grass mats break off, float down the river, and become nurseries for fish. Here he just threw his net. It's got a lead sinkers on it, and it captures any large fish that's in this area. And that would be lunch or dinner for us. Another uh, favorite way is uh, my friend Eduardo. His nickname was Dudu. He's been on Discovery. If you watch uh, television, you might see him. He's on a lot of shows in Brazil. And this is a special net we used to collect small aquarium fish. And of course, I would go any way I could to catch any kind of fish I can. And uh, here was in the, in the swampy, wet area. Animals that lived underwater, in water, and above the water. And what did we see? Beautiful angel fish. Large angel fish that I would catch with nets at night. More catfish. Catfish, I had no idea what type. Some of them weren't even named. They were so new to science. And then large catfish, like the red tail catfish that my friend Jeff caught late at night. This is a zebra pleco, a uh, very interesting fish, a gold nugget. These fish are uh, very rare here, not in the Brazil. And this fish, a uh, uh, catfish, most of the fish, uh, not like in the aquarium, they were used to being attacked or fighting off, and you can see the damage on the fin of this guy. The zebra pleco, and when these first came to the country, these were over $100 each in pet stores. Very rare. A Pellegrini catfish, each one of these, a different species. Now, what we would do is we would go with the scientists. We'd collect these catfish at night, and they would, uh, we would help them identify the different species that are in that population of animals. My favorite fish in the world is the discus. It's called a discus because of its shape. And I just love this fish. It's mostly because I like it. <laughs> The cardinal tetra is a fish that uh, the locals there know when to collect after they've laid their eggs, and they are collected and sold all over the world. Our job was to do research and to find, for example, here we're searching in a sunken log that was decomposing. The nutrients were putting back in the water, but fish, catfish, were eating it and living in the cracks and, and uh, uh, the small parts of it. So we would pull this apart and look for catfish. At night, we would hunt for a reptile called the caiman. And this was a little guy that I caught. Very sharp teeth. 
catches fish. Beautiful, he's suited with adaptations. Now we also lived on the boat, and the boat uh, we would go to different places and and uh, explore. And the foods that uh, we always we use maps a lot. Uh, you see bananas or plantains and orange fresh juices, and we would use maps to see which river we'd go up and uh, where we were going to go next. Mangoes, bread, coffee. A lot of these things came from the forest. For example, pineapple came from the uh, forest of Brazil. And the fish and the vegetables, unbelievable. Unbelievable, the, the beans and the rice and uh, the manioc. Many of these things came right from the jungle. And we kept them fresh on the boat. And uh, I'll tell you, it was, um, I, I love the food. Now, I did bring peanut butter from the States just in case, <laughs> but we never really needed to use it. This was a typical lunch. This was a, a fish, a piranha, with another type of fish, beans and rice. And I'm telling you, it makes me hungry just looking at it. Uh, during the day and night, we'd collect fish. We'd do water changes on the boat and make sure the fish were fresh and uh, and kept alive to bring back to aquariums here in the States. Now, if you notice, since the river uh, floods, you have to have steps to go up and down. In some season, the water comes all the way up, but the people depend on the river for everything, including washing their clothes. But just when I thought I knew what this ecosystem was like, we'd go to another part of it, and it looked totally different. White sands, different types of palm trees, Hardly any vegetation that would grow in the sand. All the living stuff was above the ground. People would um, have their homes. It's a very nice home. My friend Miguel, this was his summer home. Of course, it's on stilts because the river rises. Churches up high at Barcelos. Then there's all kind of habitats, hard uh, rocks. Very, very old part of South America. Now would you like to go to school here, an open school room, kids from all ages, that's the entire school in one room. Now, some since it floods and since the soil's not that rich, a type of plant called an epiphyte lives up in the trees and it takes in moisture and insects and everything it needs from the air and just beautiful orchids like you see here, and plants. This is a, a kapok tree with another parasite growing in it. So the relationships between the organisms, this one tree might house thousands of animal populations and insect populations and thousands of different types. This was a giant of the forest. There was a book called The Kapok Tree where you can learn about all the different animals that live in this tree. In fact, uh, my friend Eduardo, I, I took uh, some uh, science books, Sarah saw a blue macaw and uh, the kapok tree that I donated to some schools down in the Amazon. This is a tree that was not only special for Brazil, but for the whole world. This is a, a rubber tree. And every day people would walk, and for a long time they would spend five hours walking to each tree where they had cut grooves in it, and they would collect the latex that would drip slowly out of this tree. Then they'd go to the next tree and the next tree. After five hours, they'd make their way back home, dump the latex into a bucket, and then go back and collect them in the evening, get home late, eat dinner, and they would do that every day. You see, latex was a natural sap from the rubber tree that could be smoke cured and turned into rubber. They were the first people to invent rubber. And I have some rubber samples to share with you. Things are big in the Amazon. <laughs> the world's largest lily, the Amazon lily, several feet across, filled with adaptations for survival, including sharp spines underneath, flowers that close at night. You can see this is one plant with giant leaves coming off of it. So that was life on the riverbank, but I'll tell you, um, the, the people there are just beautiful people to know. The Caboclos, they've lived their whole, their whole life. And usually you 
If you want to make a home, you make it on large logs that you float. When the river goes up, your home goes up. Time to move? You pull it downstream or upstream. Mammals, there are mammals in the Amazon. This is a, a three-toed sloth, and it's suited for the Amazon. There was sloth. This is a very interesting uh, mammal that eats, it's a herbivore, eats vegetation. This uh, is a, a small, uh, a small mammal, and it uh, uh, a guti that uh, has very sharp teeth for eating uh, hard, hard nuts that that most animals can't cut through. And you can see its adaptations, the dots, the speckles on it, so it hides in the shadows. And then there's monkeys, the the one on the left, that is. This is my friend. This monkey, uh, uh, a New World monkey from South America. Uh, my friend uh, uh, here, uh, Patrick, he would. this monkey would not leave his shoulder for some reason. We finally had to put water on the monkey to get him to get off. <laughs> uh, since it's hot so time, so almost all the time, the only way to really cool off is to go swimming in the Amazon. Now, when most of the people were done uh, with the day activities, that's when I would go on at night and look for tarantulas. These tarantulas are facing down because animals would come, insects would come up out of the water and go higher to dry off. And the tarantula, like this pink toed aviculera, would wait for it. I caught this guy and brought him back. It's beautiful, just beautiful. And the diversity of these tarantulas, these are not spiders, these are tarantulas. Now, the snakes, there are lots of snakes down there, and uh, many of them are poisonous. This is a, uh, uh, a water uh, cobra. This one actually is a, a poisonous a snake, and uh, this, someone else had actually killed this snake, and you can see it's very sharp fangs. I didn't kill it, but it, uh, they had killed it, and so we preserved it so I could get a picture of it. Another way to cool off is to water ski in the Amazon. Not everybody can say they water skied the Amazon. I tell you, uh, I love the, uh, the it, it rains all the time, which is a, a uh, part of the ecosystem in the tropical rainforest, and the plants and animals are used to this rain. It's a beautiful place, a lot to learn. And I hope, um, I hope you've learned a little bit more about what the Amazon River is like, and there's so many videos. Uh, I have some videos online that you can see about life uh, on the Amazon. And the best way to learn about the Amazon is to compare it to, like, say, a river you know, like the, uh, the Wabash River here in Indiana or the Mississippi River. How are they alike? How are they different? How is the biodiversity of the Amazon compared to, let's say, the Ohio River? There's a lot to learn, and the first place to start is to learn the parts of an ecosystem, the habitats, the biomes, the animal populations, the biotic and the abiotic are the living and the non-living things. Hope you enjoyed this. I can't wait to teach you more.